What a wonderful way to start our time of worship this morning. Thank you so much. Just want to remind you of a couple of things and make you aware of something. Uh, you may not can see what this is. This is our Deering Baptist Church uh, contact information that I updated this week and got uh, things changed, new people that have come on here, uh, others. Have, you know, this, this is a new list, an updated list. That's what I'm telling you. So you can find those in your entrance. And so I encourage you to pick one of those up uh, at the end of the service. Don't rush out and get it now. Uh, I've got to get one now, they say. Anyway. Uh, also, a building committee, I believe, needs to meet immediately following this service. So building committee, keep that in mind as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. And Lord, I thank you for each person that's that's here today. And, and we give you praise for your presence that's here today. Yes. And Father, we know as we gather here that there are many, many things on the hearts and minds of those who are here. For some, we pray that, that are traveling either are back home or traveling, uh, going to be traveling away soon. We pray for traveling mercies for them. For some that are recovering from from uh, surgeries, we pray that you'll just continue to bless them and heal them. Father, there are many on our hearts and minds today that are struggling with, with various kinds of illnesses and infirmities, and we just lift them to you knowing that you hear our prayers and then you answer them according to your holy and perfect will. Lord, we do give you praise for this time together and pray that all that we do will bring honor and glory to your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, children, come join me at the front. I've got a friend with me today. It's my pet. I, actually, I sleep with it. It gives me comfort when I sleep with it. It's a sheep. You're so I was going to ask what this is. I, I couldn't decide if it was a sheep or not. Okay, I'll, I'll let you hold it. That is what, let me ask you, what if you had a favorite toy and you couldn't find it? What would you do if you had a favorite toy and you couldn't find it? What would you do? Would you just say, oh, well, I got lots of other toys? Or would you search and search and search until you found it? And in searching, would you drive your mommy and daddy crazy saying, I can't find it, you need to help me? I think a lot of that latter would happen, won't you? Yeah. But you wouldn't give up, would you, if you couldn't find your favorite toy? You wouldn't find it. Well, in the Bible this morning, when in the sermon, I'm going to talk about uh, some, th some, some, some things that Jesus talked about. And one of them was about a shepherd who had 100 sheep. That's a lot of sheep, isn't it? 100 sheep. And one little sheep got lost it was lost and you know the shepherd didn't say oh well I've got a hundred I got 99 sheep still I'll just forget that one he didn't say that he went and he looked and he searched and he searched and he looked and he kept looking and he kept looking until he found the one lost sheep and then you know what he did he picked it up and carried it back to the other sheep. And he was so excited that he found his one sheep. Why did he do that? Because he cared about his sheep. He really loved them. And that reminds us of how much God loves us, doesn't it? Even though there's millions of people in the world, every one of us, God loves so much. He loves every one of us so much. And it doesn't matter that there are millions of other people that he loves. He loves us also. He loves us so much. Okay? 
Let's thank him for that. Father, we thank you so much for loving us. And that, Father, we thank you that you're always with us. And that you actually love us enough that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. So that we could ask you for forgiveness of our sins. And we could, you could, you could uh, welcome us into your family. And we could go to heaven when, when our time here on this earth is, is gone. But Father, thank you so much for, for your love. And thank you for these boys and girls. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I'd like to take this to the nursery. Time to get a helper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Pop's lamb. So he's Pop's lamb. Lamb. All right, your turn to sing this morning. If you will take your red hymnals, turn to hymn number 449. Y'all probably know most of this one by heart. 449, Because He Lives, please stand for our offertory to <laughs>
offering, Father, that's offered up, Father. Father, I pray we use them to better your kingdom and honor of Jesus Christ, Lord, in precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
lush choir. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful song, and you always lead us so well into worship and worship. So thank you for that. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Some very familiar uh, passages here. And while you're turning there, um, I want you to listen to what is one of the most, if not the most famous verse in the Bible, and that's John 3.16. John 3.16 reveals the heart of God to us. It also <coughs> gives the <coughs> states who the first original missionary was. <coughs> that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 gives us the heart of God as a heart of love. And it tells us that the Lord is the very first missionary. Why do I say that? What does a missionary do? They leave home and go to another place to tell, share the gospel. Jesus left home, didn't he? He left the, the perfection and the glory of heaven. And he took on flesh and he came to earth. To live and be the gospel. He is the first missionary. You see, that was God's plan before the creation of the world. His plan was for his only son, Jesus Christ, to come to earth, to be born of a virgin, to, to live a sinless life, and to die for our sins on the cross. Amen. So why did Jesus willingly do this? Well, because of his amazing love, he did not want anyone to spend eternity in hell. Amen. That's the heart of God. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus, Christians, and if we're going to be on mission for him in the world around us, then here's the reality. Our hearts must be moved by the same things that move his heart. And our hearts must rejoice over the same things that would cause his heart to rejoice. Amen. So to learn about, the, to remind ourselves about the heart of God, we're going to look in Luke 15. And here Jesus tells three parables in response to criticism from the religious leaders about the people he was spending time with, about the people he was hanging out with. But what was their criticism? Look in Luke chapter 15. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, to Jesus. They were, they were coming near to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. How dare he? He's hanging out with sinners. They didn't understand him at all, did they? Why did Jesus come to earth? To die for sinners. Amen. And he's hanging out with sinners. And the religious folks are getting upset. Yes. So why did, he, why did he spend time with sinners? Because they were the ones who needed to experience his love and grace. Amen. The truth is that the Lord is calling us to spend time with the sinners around us. Amen. With your Bibles open to Luke chapter 15, I'm, I'm going to read all three of these parables. And then we're going to look at what it tells us about the heart of God. It says, so he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one who is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, rejoice with me, for I have found my, my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, 
There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Amen. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and, and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Mm -hmm. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and began to be in, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and, I, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, for this, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost. And he is found. And they begin to celebrate. So what do these parables <coughs> teach us about the heart of God? Amen. And what do they teach us about our heart as, as we recognize and realize we've been called to be on mission for him and with him? So what does it teach us? First of all, it teaches us that God loves the lost. We can see the love of God for lost people in these parables. See, only a shepherd who loves his sheep would leave the 99 and go looking for the one lost sheep. Amen. The knowledge that he still had 99 sheep <coughs> does not compensate for the sense of loss and concern over the one sheep that is lost. Amen. We can also see the love of God in the face of the Father who looks intently across the horizon waiting for his lost son to come home. Only a father who truly loves his son could resist the temptation to go after the son to force him to come home, but instead he patiently waits for the son to come to his senses. Amen. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Amen. So here's the question we need to ask ourselves this morning. Do we love the lost people like God loves them? Do we love them so much that we're giving of ourselves to, 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 to get to know them and to share the love of Jesus with them? Do we love them so much that we're willing to do whatever it takes to reach them because we do not want anyone to perish in hell? Or do we have a different attitude? Do we have the attitude that, that's opposite of this shepherd in the parable? <clears throat> The attitude that says if just one sheep wanders off, let him wander back. Or we may think that we have to, we have 99 more, let him go. Just one sheep. 
Do we have the attitude that says if, if the son made the deliberate choice to leave, let him go. Let's just focus on what I have left. Come on. Do we have the attitude that says if the lost and unchurched want to come to church, they know where it is, so why should we go to them? I hope not. Because the lost are out there waiting. Amen. And they desperately need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we should go to them and the unchurched because Jesus loves them enough that he died for them and he calls us to love them enough to go to them and share his love with them. Amen. The Lord keeps reminding me of something. You know, you go out in the world today and you see some freaky looking people. Have you noticed that? Amen. You, you see people dressed in all kinds of ways with all kinds of stuff on their, I mean, they just look weird. And I'm saying this as a guy in a suit, so you know, they probably think I look weird. But all these weird looking people that look strange, all these weird looking people, all the people that are so different from us in so many ways, that maybe in their beliefs and maybe in their priorities and maybe in their morals or lack of morals, all the people that we look out in the world and say, these are strange people, we're living in a strange world. Every one of them, Jesus loved enough to die on the cross for them. Amen. And they desperately need to hear the gospel. Amen. Desperately. God loves the lost. The question is, do we? Or do we have the attitude, I've got mine, I've got my salvation, I'm good. Let them get theirs. I hope not. The second point is this, God seeks the lost. In the parables of Luke 15, we see that God seeks the lost for their own good. That one lost sheep, think about it. He's in terrible danger from other animals from severe weather if he is not found quickly. And notice the limits that the shepherd will go to in order to find the lost sheep. In verse 4 it says, he searches when? Until he finds it. Not until he gets tired. Not until he gets frustrated. Not until it gets too hard. He keeps searching until he finds it. Amen. There's a lot in that phrase there for us when it comes to that uh, seeking lost people and wanting to share the gospel on them, with them. Because how often do we say it's just too hard? Or they don't want to talk to me? Or whatever the excuse is we may have, but be like the shepherd, search until we find. Amen. You see, the, also the lost coin cannot realize its true value until it's found. And the lost son can never be what he was meant to be until he comes home. Amen. We also see that God seeks the lost persistently. As we've already mentioned, God is like the shepherd who searches through every hill and every valley until he finds the one lost sheep. God is like the woman who searches every corner of the house until she finds the lost coin. He's persistent. Amen. There's an old, old poem, and I can't remember the, all the words, but I remember the title. I was first introduced to it in seminary. That's how long ago it was. And it's about God, and the title is The Hound of Heaven. Amen. Google it sometime. The Hound of Heaven. You'll find it. It reminds me of this. But we also see that God seeks for the lost patiently. God is like that father who patiently waits on the son to come to his senses and come home. And God will provide as many witnesses as needed to turn the lost toward himself. He's patient. Amen. He will provide witness after witness after witness to point them to Jesus. You see, these parables are about the very nature of God <coughs> and what should be the nature of his church. Amen. 
But remember what led the Jesus to tell these parables were the words of the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Remember they were grumbling because he was spending time with sinners. He was spending time with sinners. Imagine that. The Son of God who left the perfection of glory and of heaven to come and die on the cross for sinners is spending time with sinners. I can't believe they were not I, I can't understand why they're shocked by that. But today, do you know we still have the same problem? It seems like we work very hard to insulate ourselves from the very world Jesus says we should focus on. It seems we, we kind of create without intending to a, a kind of a Christian bubble. For Christians live surrounded only by other Christians and as a result, there are very few of us among the lost who we get to know in a closer way. Amen. I have a hunch that for most of us right now, if I ask how many lost people do you know, most of us wouldn't know any. We know where they live, maybe. But do we know them? Or do we live in our bubble? But God is, is on a mission outside of our Christian bubble and he's seeking the lost. He reminds us that he expects us to do the same. Amen. But here's the good news. Or more good news. God doesn't expect us to go on mission for him on our own. Before we go out to minister, maybe we go, we, there's someone we want to talk to, someone we want to visit, someone we want to invite to church or share the gospel with. Did you know before you go to them, the Holy Spirit is already at work? Amen. The Holy Spirit is at work in your life. He's at life and work in the life of the person that you're going to visit. When, when, we, when we try to draw a backslidden believer, that's an old word, isn't it? Backslidden. We try to draw a backslidden believer back into the fold of God's family and back into the church. We're working alongside the Holy Spirit. Amen. So often we say, well, I don't want to go visit anybody. I don't, want to, I don't want to talk about matters of faith. I don't know what to say. And God says, I've got you covered on that. Amen. The Holy Spirit is in us. He's with us. And when we go, take a step of faith and go in his name to talk to others about Jesus. Amen. He gives us the words to say. He gives us the words to say. The Holy Spirit guides us. He teaches us. And the Lord is seeking the lost to come to faith in him and so should we. Amen. Last point. God celebrates when the lost are saved. Amen. Look again at the parables in Luke 15. How does the shepherd respond when he finds the one lost sheep? Look at verses 5 through 7. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Now look at verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, you might be thinking, well, righteous people need repentance too. Remember, who's he responding to here? The religious leaders who thought they were righteous and they thought they were perfect. They thought they didn't need to repent. So what Jesus is actually saying here is there's joy and more joy in heaven over one sinner, one person who recognizes they're a sinner and repents than over 99 people who think they don't need to repent and think they're righteous on their own merits. But how does the woman respond when she finds the Lord's lost coin? Verses 9 and 10. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Now look at verse 10. There's a slight difference in how Jesus says this. Just so I tell you, 
There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's joy before the angels of God. Now, who, who is before the angels of God? God. So who's rejoicing? Who's celebrating over one sinner who repents and comes to faith? God. God is celebrating. How does the father respond when his son comes home? Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they begin to celebrate. Do we celebrate the things that God celebrates? If we're not careful in churches, we get caught up in, in, the, in the beads, the budgets and buildings, you know? <coughs> but what God wants to do is he wants us to celebrate what's important to him. Amen. <coughs> him. Rejoice over what causes the Father to rejoice. Be excited over the greatest of all miracles, and that is the salvation of the lost. Get excited over the greatest of all miracles in our life, and that is that once we were lost, but now we're found. Once we were blind, but now we see. That's what God gets excited about. There's nothing wrong with budgets and buildings. Churches got to have them. We need to have them. We need to keep them up. But the most important thing, the reason we use our budget and our buildings is to reach the lost, is it not? Amen. Is it not? Well, if we're going to be on mission for the Lord, we have to have the heart of God, don't we? Amen. We need to love the lost. We need to seek the lost. We need to rejoice when the lost come home to Christ. So the question is, do we have the heart of Christ? Or do we have the heart of the older brother? There's more to that last parable, and I didn't read it. Amen. But you see that with this older brother out in the field, the older son, the older brother to the one who went and squandered everything. He came near that night when they were celebrating. He came near to the house and he, he hears music. He sees dancing. And he called one of the servants over and asked, what is going on? What, what happened here? And the servant said to him, well, your brother's come home. And your father has <coughs> killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Amen. Now we might expect a... The, the older brother would be excited. He's home. Amen. But not him. Amen. He became angry. Refused to go in the house. Refused to go in the house. His father came out and begged him to come in. And listen to how he talked to his father. Look these many years I have served you. Ooh. I served you? Amen. <clears throat> Not I helped you? I worked with you? I served you? It's kind of cold, isn't it? He's saying, I felt like a servant. And I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat. You never celebrated me and I'm, that I might celebrate with my friends. But notice this in verse 30. But when this son of yours, he couldn't even call him his brother. This son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, who killed the fattened calf for him. And look what the father said to him. Whereas he talks about being the father's servant, the father says, son. Amen. Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It's, it's good, it's fitting that we celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he was found. Amen. 
father was reflecting the heart of God, wasn't he? Amen. He was reflecting the heart of God. Jesus reflected the heart of God. Amen. The way he lived, the way he died. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Amen. This table before us, the Lord's Supper table, it reminds us of the heart of God, doesn't it? Amen. It reminds us of the heart of God, a, a heart that was willing, a life that was willing to give up life and, and, and heaven, the perfection and glory of heaven and take on flesh and come to this earth. And die in our place. Amen. Was willing to give up everything so that we might live. This is the heart of God. Amen. We see the, the bread, the crackers here that, that remind us of the body of Jesus that was beaten and bleeding and broken. Why? For us. Amen. We see the juice that reminds us of the blood of Jesus that was shed. Why? So that it was because it was shed for repentance of our for, for forgiveness of our sins, to pay the price for our sins. Amen. This is the heart of God. It reminds us of the heart of God. He was willing to do anything and everything, no matter what it cost him. Amen. So that we could have eternal life with him. That's how much he loves us. Amen. That's how much he loves us. So as we gather, as we as the, as the deacons come forward now for our communion, I want us just to pause and pray and thank the Lord for his goodness. <clears throat> Father, we thank you and we give you praise. Because your heart is so pure with love and joy, grace and mercy. We cannot come to this table without thinking about how much you love us. We cannot come to this table without thinking about your grace. Your amazing grace and your mercy. Because we deserve none of it. We deserve hell, Father. But by your grace and mercy, you make provisions for us to spend eternity with you in heaven. So we celebrate. We don't, we don't grieve. We don't mourn. One reason because our Lord and Savior is not dead. We just come to this table with thanks for your amazing love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Jesus said to his disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. All of you eat it. crucified, Jesus said to his disciples, this is my blood which is shed for you. It was shed for the forgiveness of sins. So let's just be so thankful for that amazing gift. And then he said to them, all of you drink it. spoken to you this morning in any way and you need to respond we're going to stand and sing it in number 434 I have decided to follow Jesus if you need to respond publicly in any way you need to come for rededication or, or to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior I pray that um, if, this, if the day is the day I pray you'll come won't you, won't you stand and sing